thank you everyone for joining us today for the webinar, Tenets of Good Corporate Governance. I'm very pleased to introduce our presenters today, Joe Iwasaki and Richard LeBlanc. Joe is Head of Corporate Governance within the Professional Insights Team of ACCA and has published on a wide range of corporate governance topics, including governance principles, board responsibilities, and diversity. A qualified accountant, she is trained in tax and audit. In addition to corporate governance, she has also extensive experience in auditing and assurance. Dr. Richard LeBlanc is one of Canada's leading experts on corporate governance and accountability. He is an award-winning teacher, researcher, lawyer, public speaker, consultant, and specialist on boards of directors. He has taught at leading universities, including Harvard, and has received a teaching award as one of the top five university teachers in Ontario. He was named Canadian Who's Who and is a past recipient of Canada's Top 40 Under 40 Award. We're very pleased to have you both with us today. Over to you, Joe and Richard. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. So, um, thank you very much for everyone to call in again. My name is Joy Wasaki, and apologies for uh, those people who heard me slightly panicking at the, uh, the difficulty of connecting to the line. Um, so, I, I hope you are looking at the, uh, the front cover of our publication, Tenets of Good Corporate Governance. Um, the, um, briefly, let me explain the uh, background of this publication. Um, we have been looking at the purpose of corporation, purpose of good corporate governance for some time. And we recognize that the focus of the topic is changing over time. So there has been a much focus on procedures of what governance means, but this is moving towards the effect of applying a good process. And as many people have discussed, uh, corporate governance can be sometimes seen as some sort of compliance exercise, some sort of box ticking um, exercise. But it has been always recognized as a means to achieve a long-term goal. So um, we at ACCA have decided to explore some critical questions for companies and also societies that surround companies. The, uh, the result is the publication itself. So in this webinar, we would like to go through uh, key topics that we cover in this publication. These are made up of long existing uh, topics and new themes. And the publication is based on uh, a number of um, st leading thinkers in the area of governance. And one of them is Richard. So, um, so I'm very excited to, to explore these topics with you. Terrific, me too, uh, Joe. Excellent. Um, so let's look at the first slide, which is about diversity and balance. So there has been many initiatives around diversity, focusing on what's, what it means for the board, and companies are making progresses due to a number of actions such as quotas and targets and disclosures. Um, and many of us are now looking at the executives and executive pipeline. And then you might have noticed the title, diversity and balance. We, we differentiate slightly those two points. Diversity is really about having different viewpoints and having different perspectives, what people can bring to the table. But even if we try to maximize the diversity, sometimes we look at the boardroom and then people still look the same. So that might be reflective of some sort of obstacles and barriers that exist in the process of people getting promoted and reached, you know, the, uh, where they are. So, um, our question, that, what, the question that we would like to explore now is, what sort of examples, Richard, have you seen and practices have you recommended to companies to, to improve diversity among executives and in also non-executive positions? Over to you. Great, thanks, Joe, and it's great to be here, and it's great to have assisted Joe and ACCA in this publication, which I think is really leading edge and talks about um, the key trends that are happening in governance, one of which is diversity. So the answer to the question um, of uh, examples that are, uh, are very good and good practices is that, first of all, is defining diversity. Uh, diversity, uh, uh, what I'm seeing now is um, matrices uh, for boards and for senior management team and teams. And some of the touch points for diversity include, in no particular order, age, uh, diversity, um, gender, 
uh, diversity. I'm also seeing gender identity uh, on board and senior management matrices. Um, uh, Aboriginal uh, or Indigenous uh, uh, diversity, ethnic diversity, uh, accessibility and disability, and I'm also seeing now in the last uh, year or two LGBTQ on diversity um, matrices. Now where regulators are going is they're not imposing this, um, although it, it is quotas are starting in North America. Um, what they're asking for is for boards to take a look at their their customer base, their membership base, um, and, and try to match uh, the the, uh, diversifi the diversity of your base uh, with your senior management and with your uh, board of directors. Um, and they're doing this from a variety of perspectives, through disclosure, through tracking, uh, uh, talent pools, um, uh, all the way up right into the boardroom. And this has caused some frustration because uh, boards have traditionally been homogenous and um, uh, the evidence is that um, homogenous boards can make poor decisions and by diversifying you uh, limit uh, groupthink and the decisions uh, become more effective. So regulators now in some 49 countries have, have begun uh, imposing uh, regulation either in the form of quotas or measurable objectives. In Canada, we use measurable objectives, um, which is uh, uh, t uh, uh, tell uh, your shareholders what portion of uh, these various groups you think you should have in your management team and your board um, and uh, disclosure. Um, so the best practices are um, you should have a board, a good board should have a, a competency matrix, uh, a behavior matrix, matrix and a diversity uh, matrix. Um, and they should track uh, that and they should make all of these matrices public. Um, the second uh, best practice is term limits. Um, in order to diversify a board, you need to, uh, and boards have been decreasing in size, in order to diversify, you have to, you have to impose term limits. And I'd say now about 25% of companies have term limits. Um, in some countries, they're being mandated, the U United Kingdom, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, India, uh, Australia, nine to 10 years on the board. I'm seeing credit unions, and I know there are a number of credit unions on the call with 12-year term limits. I'm also seeing uh, banks with 15-year term limits. So this is another discussion that the board should have of, of um, uh, the desirability of term limits in order to facilitate diversity. Um, and the second, the, th the third and last best practice for diversifying boards is having a talent pool um, into the boardroom and into senior management. And that talent pool I'm starting to see, for example, advisory boards and um, having uh, committee members who are not uh, directors, but they sit on the committee uh, to develop a talent pool uh, into the boardroom um, and bringing people onto the board who are not previously known to any of the directors. What tends to happen when you bring someone onto the board is they tend to look like you um, and they tend to be friends and colleagues and that's not good because they are not independent of each other. So once you execute the competency and behavioral matrix, then you should go into communities uh, that you don't necessarily know or have contacts with and, and, and attempt to uh, bring people onto the board from diverse communities that are not previously known professionally or personally to individual directors. Um, so those three best practices, uh, which are all three matrices, uh, term limits and development of a talent pool uh, and a pipeline, I think are, are, are good practices for, for uh, diversity and balance on the board. Thank you, Richard. Um, I suppose um, you often hear the, uh, the question from companies side that um, whether the diversity really brings benefit to companies. Would you have any good observation to share on this? Well, there, there are studies, and the, the, the literature is mixed, but there are studies, and it's very difficult to track because inside a boardroom, um, that's difficult to measure. Um, I, I notice, certainly in my client boards, that the magic number I think is three, is once you have three diverse directors, um, the discussion changes, and there tends to be more give and take, there tends to be more constructive uh, challenge, uh, uh, but that, that, that's difficult to measure, but first of all, to calibrate that and also to draw the link between boardroom discussions and financial performance. 
but certainly um, there's a there's a, a consensus among regulators and academics that um, that 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 diversity is long overdue, and there's an increasing uh, lack of tolerance with the slow movement. Uh, for example, two weeks ago in California, um, they're introducing quotas for all California companies with significant financial penalties for not diversifying uh, the board mm -hmm. on the basis of gender. So I, I predict that this is now reaching North America. It started in Europe and Asia. Um, it's not going away and companies can decide, you know, what if anything they want to do. But I think experience has shown that if boards, if boards continue to drag their feet, then then regulation will happen. The industry minister in Canada, Navdeep Baines, has said that he's not ruling out quotas in in Canada if if disclosure alone doesn't get us there. So I guess the answer to your question, um, Joe, is that um, it's not going away, and it's 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 certainly front and center. It's it's one of the top issues for many boards right now is is the, is board composition. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think um, similarly we can say that. Um, uh, you know, the diversity is a kind of topic that it's very difficult to measure the positive effect in the short term. And we need to concentrate on what is the right thing to do. Just like many other aspects of corporate governance, it's very difficult to say what is measurable and what is positive in the short term. Let's exactly. look at the next topic, um, which is enabling an effective boardroom. So this is a long-lasting agenda, and then every time when crisis hits, this topic gets focused. And um, one of the key points that has become clear in enabling an effective boardroom is the role of the chair. There are many aspects, but let's focus on this one. Are there good guidelines that are helpful for people who chair, whether it is a boardroom or team? Richard. Well, the answer is no, and that's unfortunate because there has there there's not a maturity in terms of roles and responsibilities of a board chair like there is, for example, the CEO or individual directors. But there has been um, there has been a maturity at least in practices. Um, the second most important decision that a board makes is the selection of. Uh, of, of, of chair, um, and to do this, um, uh, there should be a, a position description for the chair, roles and responsibilities, and there should be attributes of the uh, individual who's capable of fulfilling that position description. The latest statistics are that a chair role is in the neighborhood of 400 hours a year. This is a non-executive uh, chair uh, uh, role. Um, there should be a committee, and that's normally the governance or nominating committee that is in charge of chair succession planning. Um, uh, one or two year uh, term limits for chairs are, are inadequate. Um, three years is, uh, is considered a best practice. Anything over four or five, and then you begin to have uh, an entrenched uh, chair. Uh, the chair should be assessed uh, once a year as part of the uh, board uh, review. Uh, the chair should have a, a good working relationship with the CEO, uh, and I term it uh, uh, close, but not too close. Uh, you're not friends. Um, you should not be uh, doing offline activities uh, together that would compromise the chair's independence. Um, the chair should have uh, should be very adept at running meetings. Um, I've been involved in the last two years with uh, 18 chair and CEO succession uh, successions, um, simply because and the selection of CEO is the first responsibility of the board. The selection of chair is the second. But if you've got the wrong chair, then um, and not all chairs are the right chairs, mind you. But if you have the wrong chair, the board will never be effective. The greatest determinant on boardroom effectiveness is the effectiveness of the chair. Uh, so some of the big ticket items for chair effectiveness are uh, establishing the agenda. I'm seeing much more activity by board chairs in the order of the agenda, the narrowness of certain topics, the broadness, putting strategy on the agenda, um, information monitoring by the board chair, uh, quantity, quality, timeliness, source, and form format. Um, uh, one thing that a chair is not good at, and this touches on one of your questions, um, Joe, is, um, is criticism of, of, of other directors. So your question is, is a board different from any other meeting? It is and it isn't. It is uh, different because a board meets six or seven times a year, uh, so they, they're, not, they're not like a senior management team. They're not working together, but there is a tendency for a chair when a chair sees 
rogue behaviors uh, by one or more directors to not criticize and not uh, have an offline discussion. I'm now seeing more active chairs involved in overseeing conflicts of interest, overseeing lack of performance, lack of preparation, uh, lack of commitment, um, education on behalf of individual directors, uh, letters of reprimand. Um, so I'm seeing a real focus on holding other directors accountable uh, by the board chairs. But not all board chairs do this. The, the, I think the weakest uh, 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 responsibility of board chairs is the ability to be is, is to uh, criticize and to and to hold other directors accountable and to lead by example. So certainly we've seen a maturity in the last two or three years, uh, or, or, or or even five. Um, the the new UK code came out a few weeks ago, and and the chair role again is front and center. So so this is uh, um, a role that is very important and and warrants. Uh, greater uh, scrutiny and greater research, um, including that by shareholders, uh, sh uh, the shareholder input into who the board chair should be. Uh, so this is a this is a work in progress, but it's it's rapidly maturing. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Um, talking about boardroom, we uh, are looking at uh, executive pay which is also an, an ongoing topic which has long existed. And some people argue that this is overemphasized by media, but others would say in absolute terms that executive pay is simply too high. What is view, your view on this topic? Well, executive pay is the one area that has been unsolved by regulators. Um, pay, uh, and this is not a value judgment, it's just a, a simple statement of fact, is the pay in absolute terms has continued to go up and up and up. And the link between pay and performance, if you look at any recent study, it looks like a scatter plot. So it's not, there's, a, there's, there's, there's no linking between pay and performance and the absolute value of pay has tended to, gone up, to, to, to go up. So regulators, I think, are offering misguided solutions. Where the regulators tend to come from, for example, if they see the absolute value of pay going up, they impose pay ratios in the UK, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the United States, or, or say on pay in Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom. Now, say on pay and pay ratios don't address the, the uh, inability to link pay and performance. Um, in fact, arguably, uh, they, make, they make it worse because uh, you've got pay consultants have access to all of this data and they sell it back to, uh, to and I, it, this is not a, a, a slight on pay consultants, this, tends, this, this concept of peer benchmarking is what exacerbates the absolute value of pay and decouples the link between pay and performance because compensation committees become obsessed with, and in, including CEOs, with what other CEOs of larger, more complex institutions are, 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 are earning. And because regulators have, have focused on disclosure as a way to uh, uh, link pay to performance, um, uh, the data is there. So, that, so this concept of peer benchmarking at the 75th or 90th percentile, that and that alone, in fact, there's an interesting study at University of Delaware, that alone has caused a, a double-digit increase year over year, irrespective of performance. Um, so we know that there's a problem, but this, what's the solution? So the solution is um, good boards now are deep, are, are realize the decoupling between pay and performance, and they're focusing on performance. So what they want is a strategic plan um, that is, you know, values, vision, mission, strategy, but they, they don't stop there. Um, activist uh, board members and activist shareholders will go right into the business model, the key value drivers, um, and they will calibrate performance of the business model and the value drivers at low, medium, and high levels of performance. And, and that, when you do that, you tend to have a much better grip as a board on, on performance. So, um, so uh, focus on performance inside the company, not outside. Um, outside is important, but there's been a, an obsession with outside me uh, metrics as opposed to inside. 
And what tends to happen is a board stays at a very high level, it approves the strategic plan, and it really doesn't monitor or calibrate or weigh performance of the value drivers. So good boards, and there's evidence that boards that do this create three times the enterprise value of their, of, of their peers. So pay for performance, executive pay, the focus now among good boards is on, is on performance, weighing and calibrating performance inside the organization and linking that to executive pay. Um, but that's, that's I, I would think, a minority of companies, probably 10 to 15 percent of leading companies that do this. The vast majority of companies tend to focus outside the organization. So if you want to limit your, if you want to tighten the linkage between pay and performance as a board, or even as a manager, um, you should focus on calibrating performance a little more, um, and, and, then, and then that linkage will come. The, uh, the point about uh, the disclosure, so um, for example, you know, there's, uh, the regulator's approach is primarily about um, increasing the disclosure so that uh, the external scrutiny increases. What do you think about this debate around um, how the, uh, the, pay, uh, the pay information compares with that of employees, particularly, you know, uh, the debate around organizational culture and, you know, the fair treatment of people? That sort of thing is sometimes brought in in the, uh, in the light of uh, executive compensation debate. Exactly. Exactly. You're exactly right, Joe. In fact, the, the value model that I just described, 75 percent of that is non-financial. So increasingly now, boards are going into culture and customer satisfaction, member satisfaction, employee engagement, and they're linking, in, and diversity, which we talked about, and they're linking the achievement of these metrics. So first of all, you've got to calibrate them, and then you have to link it to executive pay. And because of that not occurring, um, we have inequity uh, between worker pay, which is increased at one or two percent, and CEO pay, which is increased at 17 percent. So, uh, so this inequity has caused dissatisfaction, and regulators, again, are beginning to act here as well. In the United Kingdom, a, a, a month ago, they said we'd like an employee voice uh, on, on pay and we would like an employee voice on the board of directors. Now you can do that in one of three ways. You can have an advisory committee of employees, you can put an employee on the board, or you can have an independent director who is designated with communicating with employees. And we're now having a movement to, uh, to customers on boards as well. So the reason for this, for, for regulators uh, um, uh, taking these actions is because the, the, the worker pay has not increased uh, at the same rate of CEO pay, so so b regulators are listening um, and they're and they're acting. Uh, but I guess my point is is that uh, that's good, but it doesn't link it doesn't address the linkage between performance and pay, uh, which ultimately is the problem. Um, but regulators are you know they're they're reacting uh, to social concerns that that um, that pay really isn't a free market, and there are and I, when I interview CEOs, they tell me this. I can out done any pay committee. I mean, a pay committee essentially is three directors versus the CEO. So it, it's not really fair bargaining and a fair contract in the traditional sense. So regulators are beginning to broaden it uh, a little bit to have pay ratios, to have workers having a say on pay, to have shareholders having a say on pay. So that I think will continue. And I think the other weakness which you touched on, Joe, is, is the non-financial metrics, including culture, um, and how that is measured um, and linking that to executive pay. Absolutely. And I think um, the, yeah, the big challenge is that although um, shareholders can vote at the AGM in terms of the pay proposals, it's, um, it is a kind of indirect measure. Where do you think this, you know, fundamentally the drive to, to address the pay issue would, uh, would come from? I mean, it's a bit of a future gazing question, I suppose. It's, it, it has shown, it is future gazing, and it's shown that regulators will act, but the say on pay, the majority of say on pay packages pass. So shareholders are happy as long as shareholders are getting a return. I think the employee uh, bucket is the next wave of employee and media uh, scrutiny. Um, uh, so we're developing a, so a social aspect to questioning the quantum of pay and the link to performance, um, and that we haven't seen before. So uh, everybody has a vested interest, including employees, in terms of talent pool and 
uh, the ability to attract and retain to to see that um, that there that there's a, a, a healthy development of employee and senior management pay as well as executive pay. I'm seeing, for example, and credit unions and financial institutions, this is where this is starting, is boards are asking for the very first time, tell us incentive pay throughout the entire organization. And I'm seeing that for the first time. So, so pay, directors are becoming more aggressive in terms of pay of all employees. And it never used to be that way. It, it, it always used to be the CEO is your, one, is your number one employee. But boards now, because of conduct risk and tone at the bottom and uh, uh, what happens with, with in Canada with Toronto Dominion Bank and with uh, the telecom companies uh, of, of, of customer-facing employees, people can take actions based on incentive pay that can put the organization at risk. So we're starting to see scrutiny by boards on everybody's pay, not just the CEO's pay, and I think that that's probably a good development. Excellent. And I think that kind of neatly takes us to the next topic, which is gatekeepers of corporate governance. And uh, this is a question that we start to think about as, you know, the governance is a kind of topic that is important to any organization, uh, not just the listed companies. And then obviously existing governance uh, rules and then codes are primarily addressed to major listed companies in the capital market. But obviously it is relevant to charities, it is relevant to public sector bodies, it is uh, relevant to partnerships. So when we start to look at different types of organization, this idea that shareholders would play a gatekeeper's role if, say, for example, board doesn't act in a way they ought to be, um, they could intervene. This is not always the case. And um, as we expand the scope of governance, this becomes a, a kind of important topic. And then as you were talking about in the context of executive compensation, um, there are many parties that can have a say in terms of what is happening with prevalent use of social media and so on. People have many outlets. So um, does this really have impact on corporate governance of companies? Obviously, it has an impact on corporate governance debate. Yes, I think it does, and I think that technology has been the um, the, the, the the pressure, the driver, uh, including social media. Um, directors tell me that uh, their brand and the brand of their organization can now be put in play in 10 minutes uh, because of the use of cell phones and everybody being a camera. So it's caused gatekeepers to emerge and for the board to be comfortable retaining uh, gatekeepers. Uh, traditionally, uh, management uh, uh, retains the gatekeepers. Now, who are the gatekeepers? Well, the gatekeepers for a board now are outside, and this has happened in the last three or four years, and, and um, I think this is a welcome development. The gatekeepers, for example, the external auditor, the compensation consultant, the governance advisor, the recruitment firm, uh, the external counsel, all of these people now are hired, fired, and paid by the board or the relevant committee. And it never used to be that way. It would be that management hires these people. Now boards are uh, understanding that these gatekeepers need to be accountable to the board and to the committees. So um, even inside the organization, and there's uh, institutions on this call that I'm familiar with, in fact, there's a few clients of mine on this call, and I've said this to them as well, is internal audit, risk, compliance, and if you're an insurance company, actuary. These four independent oversight functions, they now report directly to the board and to committees. They don't report to senior management anymore. So the board and committees hires, fires, and pays the risk officer, the internal audit officer, the compliance officer, and the actuarial uh, function. So these gatekeepers now sort of are going around management and they're not being accountable to management anymore because that caused the financial crisis is the the hierarchical model of the C, everybody being accountable to the CEO. If I'm internal audit and I'm accountable to the CEO, I cannot direct the CEO to augment internal controls over cybersecurity, for example. Uh, but when I have an, a, an executive session with the chair of the audit committee, I can say in private session with the CEO and CFO not in the room that this is an issue and this needs to be addressed. So gate, there's been a rapid maturity in the development of gatekeepers. Even now boards on, on social media, they're retaining 
directly uh, risk assurance providers in the area of social media and cybersecurity that are retained directly by the board and not by senior management. And if senior management objects to that, then the board should be asking itself, well, why the objection? Because if management is doing what it should be doing, then the assurance provider, the gatekeeper, will confirm that. So I've seen in the last five years a rapid comfort and maturity by boards in retaining gatekeepers. Now that means that they have to get their hands dirty. They have to. They have to get. They, they have to actually, you know, uh, interview people. They've got to have an RFP. They've got to manage the relationship, and that takes time. So that's one of the reasons why the average directorship now is 300 hours a year, and for a board or committee chair, it's it's between 400 and 500. Is oftentimes it's the it's the it's the interaction with gatekeepers that provides a check on management. And management is just going to have to live with this fact, is that management can't control all the gatekeepers. Um, it's kind of like Enron 15 years ago where um, the CFO of Enron would hire the external auditor. Now any external auditor is always hired by the audit committee. So we have seen a proliferation of gatekeepers um, and a more active board and committee structure that retains these gatekeepers, including social media, technology, pay, governance and, and elsewhere, and that's probably a welcome development as, as well, but it's certainly put the pressure on, on boards uh, to, to, uh, to do this. Absolutely. You know, you must have come across this question before, but there are some companies that are very insensitive to what is happening around them, particularly sort of public criticism or reputation. Why do these com companies can't thrive? I think that they can thrive for a period of time, and I, I don't think uh, smaller companies are immune or charities or not-for-profit organizations. There have been examples where there's been an employee or, or, a, or an executive, and we notice this now with conduct risk and the Me Too movement, um, where um, something can happen and uh, it's, it's the front page of the news. And I've had this happen a number of times where uh, it could be someone who's inebriated at a party and it was a board chair at a casino, one example. Another example, an employee uh, grabbing a microphone and saying something, an employee in line at an airport. There's, so what boards are doing is boards are saying, is there anything in your past that you've done that could bring rep reputational harm uh, to the company, both for uh, directors and for individual executives. And if that's the case, then please bring that forward so that we do not get caught flat-footed and we can respond uh, accordingly. And, or uh, in some cases, there was one recently where it was a possession of, of drugs. Uh, we can conduct a, in a, a special committee and an independent investigation. So boards don't want to be surprised by something that was out there that they should have known about. So I'm starting to see uh, more rigorous codes of conduct for directors and for senior executives, more rigorous diversity policies, inclusive uh, sign-off procedures, and full, full, full disclosure of anything that you might have said or done in the past that might have bring, brought reputational uh, harm to yourself and, and by extension very quickly to the company. So the test for materiality now is I think we've digested financial. Um, it tends to be conduct, and it tends to be uh, non-financial reputational conduct that could harm the company. So boards are boards are becoming very assertive here, even in the recruitment phase of of background checks. I'm seeing criminal uh, checks. I'm seeing reference checks. Uh, three or four rounds of interviews. Uh, there's just a heightened sensitivity to to uh, to conduct risk, and I mean that's just the way the world is going. So it's it's uh, it, it, it's 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 probably a good thing, and by all means, if you've said or done something in your past, bring it forward and explain it. People make mistakes. It's totally fine, but what we don't want is surprises is where the boards are coming from. Absolutely. And uh, the final question is about uh, a slightly philosophical one, so the relationship between companies and society. We focus more and more where the, uh, the overall sort of society is going. Um, with the, uh, the scarce resource and probably global connectivity of the world, you know, is, is broadly understood. And then probably that focuses on the, um, the role of companies in the society. Are they part of the creation, part of the, uh, part of the, you know, the future vision of the world? Do companies, are companies expected to play a role there? Or are they just, uh, you know, 
uh, they expect it to take uh, an opportunity, to grab opportunities that are presented to them. Um, so I suppose this is about how proactive companies play a role in building the future vision. What's your view, Richard? Well, you know, traditionally the company in the United States has been shareholder wealth maximization and stakeholders are, they contract with the company and the residual goes to shareholders. In Canada and Australia and the United Kingdom, the corporation is a little broader and it includes non-shareholder stakeholders and your duty as a director is to act with a view to the corporation, not necessarily shareholders. So what we're seeing, and this is happening in the United States, Elizabeth Warren and other Democratic uh, candidates that are bringing forward about, you know, social purpose and is, is shareholder wealth maximization um, by itself, well, are there consequences to that? So we're seeing now companies become much more uh, active in terms of their reputation. Uh, customers are becoming much more sophisticated and much less tolerant of, 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 um, of inappropriate behavior, even employees. Uh, you know, one of the questions I think you have, Joe, is, is, is um, examples of, of um, uh, financial impact, um, examples of this affecting the bottom line of business. We saw that three or four times in the last year uh, in, in Canada, and this was employees. These were employees of, of Bell Canada, employees of Rogers, employees of, of uh, Toronto Dominion Bank um, that that went on the news and were uh, were uncomfortable with uh, pressure uh, that the three companies were exerting uh, on them to act in a certain way. To, and this happened with Wells Fargo in the United States to open up fictitious accounts, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, put pressure on customers, to deliver services that customers didn't need or customers didn't understand. Um, so uh, you're a risk. I mean, if you, if you if you have lower level employees and customers that can go to the media now and can use social media um, and, and then you're on the news, you're on the news that night and, and they took a hit. Uh, the Toronto Dominion stock price declined by 5% uh, within, within a week. We saw this with Canadian Airlines with the pilot being, uh, with, with one of the customers being dragged out. Um, and that, so, so uh, the ability to be scrutinized very quickly. Um, so I'm starting to see boards ask for uh, crisis response plans, for possibilities to just make sure that everybody is behaving in an appropriate manner and that there are no inappropriate uh, uh, conduct uh, uh, that, that, that can occur. So it's, I think it's caused a, a, a focus on the role that the company plays vis-a-vis -vis customers, employees, uh, the environment, um, and other stakeholders. And I think this is driven largely by, uh, by YouTube, by cell phones, by technology. Uh, that that um, uh, we see this also with police, uh, with video cameras. So I think technology has really focused on conduct risk. Um, conduct risk now is one of the top five risks for any board. And what you'd normally find is that there's very little internal controls over it. So boards are beginning to ask, well, how do we know? Integrity of certain employees, background checks, conduct risk, are they being incented appropriately? So, and this is a broader society question of the role of the corporation in society. So I think that this is a welcome development as well. Yes, and I think that leads back to the point that we were uh, discussing earlier, the uh, how long-term companies are looking at in terms of their prosperity. If they are looking at short-term, perhaps even if they ignore reputation, they may be able to compete in terms of uh, say, um, pricing, for example, or aggressive marketing. But when they consider about the long-term prosperity, it is important to attract good employees who want to be part of the long journey of the company. And I yes. suppose that makes a difference. Yes, and I think what, what the President of the United States has, has proposed, which is moving off of quarterly financial reporting, will have, if, that, if that is the case, will have an effect on longer-term metrics. 90% of executive pay is less than three years. Uh, the business cycles are five to seven years. So there needs to be a mature, and I think once you move off of quarterly reporting, if that's the case, the metrics will follow, the maturity of the metrics. And that also caused the financial crisis. So regulators are asking, please make sure that your pay structure reflects 
your cycle and not necessarily short term. If everything is short term, then you you get what you what you reward. You you'll get short term behaviors that are in the interest of the next two or three years as opposed to the next five to seven years. So Joe, there needs to be a maturity of metrics that can measure longer term performance and shareholders and compensation consultants should be developing these um, so that they have the robustness of, of short term metrics. Um, in or, so everything needs to be aligned if you're going to go up and out into the long term. Um, but we're starting to see that focus as well. And who would you say is leading that, uh, the, you know, the change in the direction? There's a would minority. The, board? no, the board, boards are doing it, but boards, they're in the system that they're in. There are a number of institutional shareholders uh, in BlackRock and others that are, that are advocating for longer term, uh, planning longer term metrics. Uh, but I think once the SEC changes, which could change with moving off of, of quarterly reporting into annual reporting or six month reporting, I think, that, I think that will be a catalyst to drive the development of longer term metrics. So I, I, I think regulators are beginning to turn their attention to this as well. I think it has to be a regulatory change. It can't be a one off uh, shareholder uh, change. It has to be system-wide. And good practice would cascade and supply chain would impact other companies yes. um, beyond, for example, a, a major capital market. So Valerie, I think we should uh, pass the line back to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a few questions waiting in the queue here. So Joe, I'm just going to mute your line. Uh, for you while we're doing the Q&A, and I will come and unmute um, for the question part, of course. So just a reminder for our audience, you have two ways to ask a question. Feel free to use the chat panel, which a few of you have already. A question will come to me, and I can ask it on your behalf. Or depending on how you're connected, you could raise your hand. That will flag me. I can unmute your telephone line, and you can speak directly to Richard and Joe. So I will copy a few questions over here as well here. So Richard can have a look in the chat panel. Sure. There is one in there already, I believe, Richard. Let me know if you can see it from oh, earlier. Oh, what does the, the behavioral matrix look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a behavioral matrix is, is the eight or nine behaviors that directors should exhibit, including in no particular order, integrity, uh, communication skills, um, impact and influence, uh, um, interpersonal and social skills, um, uh, the ability to listen. Um, uh, th these are some behaviors that can be quantified uh, and can be measured. I'll, I'll do one, for example. Integrity is resiliency, restoring healthy relationships after um, a, a disagreement. Uh, solidarity, supporting the board decision after it occurs, even if you voted against it. Um, and lastly, uh, consistency between what you say, what you do, uh, what you write, and how you act. Um, that's integrity. Um, so all of these behaviors are vital. In fact, they're of, of, of all of them, they're probably the most important because you can be independent, you can be competent, you can be diverse, but if you can't behave in a certain way, and that's all it takes is one director, then you can completely wreck a board dynamic. Um, so most of these behaviors are known before bringing the director onto the board. So, uh, and if you don't know someone's behaviors, then you haven't done your homework. This is both to the recruiters out there and also to the governance committee. So I'm seeing a much more heightened scrutiny of behaviors, reference checks, what's this person like to work with, what's this person like to work under pressure, um, so that you develop a, a matrix of individual directors and what their behaviors are and, and peer assess those behaviors um, uh, on a regular basis. Um, so that's, a, that's, in short, a behavioral matrix. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. And then another question asks about um, conduct risk. Oh, it just scooted up here for me. Um, so it says, Richard just spoke about conduct risk for the board. Could it please be possible to know all of the different categories of risk for boards besides conduct risk? Sure. Uh, the big ticket risks right now, uh, maybe I'll try to name 10 of them in no particular order, is conduct <laughs> risk, um, reputation risk, uh, um, um, operational risk, health and safety risk, uh, active shooter I'm seeing. Mm. Um, I'm also seeing uh, trade uh, risk now and tariff risk. Um, uh, obviously, financial reporting risk, market share risk, um, uh, operations risk. Uh, uh, a board should be approving all 10 of these risks. Uh, there should be a definition for each risk and there should be internal controls 
for each of these uh, 10 risks, and there should be assurance uh, by, by uh, risk compliance and internal audit that, that the uh, internal controls are designed and implemented properly. Uh, so the risk appetite framework is three things. It's define your 10 risks quantitatively and qualitatively, uh, uh, set out the internal controls for each risk, including their interaction, because a cyber risk can become a reputation risk and become a financial risk. So you want to see the internal controls, and then you want to see level three, which is the assurance. And that's where the independent oversight functions come in, uh, audit, risk, and compliance, to assure the board that the controls to mitigate those 10 risks are working. Um, so those are some of the big, bigger risks that boards should be, should be aware of and, 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 and start the conversation. This is all about mm -hmm. discussion and priorities and, and, and moving it forward. So start somewhere and start small. This, uh, you know, a robust risk management framework takes two to three to four years to develop, but, it, but you have to start somewhere. So start the discussion. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And what can elected boards do to better achieve diversity? Well, I'm, I'm seeing a movement here too. Is that uh, uh, the, bo the the governance committee will conduct the diversity analysis and then recommend to people who are running for election. Listen, these are the competencies, the desired competencies that we need. And there's, if you've got 12 and you you narrow it down to three or four, these are the behaviors we think you should have. Um, and th this is uh, the diversity that we're trying to achieve. So if you've got these competencies, these behaviors, and this diversity then please put your name forward. So I'm seeing boards, uh, be, be, even with elected boards, which I think the focus of the question is, 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 is uh, and this could be credit unions, for example, um, and this might, question might have been from a credit union, is you say to the members who are running for election, um, this is what, what we're looking for. Uh, so the board knows the board best. The board should be reaching out to elected uh, uh, members who seek to be elected as directors. Here are the the competencies, attributes, and, and diversity that we're desiring. And if you if you if you have those, it doesn't mean if you don't, you can't run. But if you do have those in particular, then you you should please consider running for election. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a few attendees that are asking for a little more information on the three matrices mentioned and also maybe an online uh, document or something else that people could refer to. Do you have anything like that? I, I, I do, and I can I can certainly send it. But but, uh, but briefly, uh, mm -hmm. the, the the competency matrices are are very common. They've been, uh, in fact, I suggested this in 2005 to the Ontario Securities Commission. So good. If you go to any good, like even the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance, um, and you go to their annual report, they will give examples of of behavior matrices, competency matrices, and diversity matrices. You don't want to be reinventing the wheel. You want to be collaborating with corporate secretaries and governance professionals to to take the matrix and to tailor it to your board so these matrices exist and they're not complicated I mean each of these matrix can be can be set out on a napkin on a, on a, on a white sheet of paper so uh, again start somewhere start small um, it's also chapter 8 of my I don't mean to be pushing my book but it's chapter 8 of my book has got very good examples um, so what are the competencies that we need and and define those competencies and then have a scale of uh, you know uh, uh, expert um, uh, basic, good, satisfactory, some scale, because you can't be good at everything, um, and define each competency. And then you know, the critical thing is that each director doesn't need to be expert at everything and can't. Um, you know, you might have a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm not an expert at accounting, uh, but I'm a, I think I have expertise in law and governance, but not accounting, not cybersecurity. So uh, it's important to realize that um, you, have, you have the competencies covered off by certain directors. Totally, totally fine. You can't. Directors think sometimes with the competencies that they have to be all things to all people. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. You just have to be good at certain things and stay good, which means continuous training, particularly industry experience, risk expertise, that type of thing. So it's not it's not hard to do. And but but again, start small and and just move it forward. Jill, I would absolutely you like to add agree anything? with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I absolutely agree with that point. I think sometimes we think the, uh, the board members have to have competence in every aspect, but that's not true because board is a collective body and each person ought to contribute something. And it is very important that uh, individual director has that awareness that she or he has something that others don't have. And I think that again plays an important role of the chair because it is a chair 
who would enable the person to bring that something different that other people don't have. And, you know, it's important to make the board member to feel comfortable mm -hmm. in that uh, boardroom context, mm -hmm. because otherwise, you know, you contribute to something and then the chair says, oh, thank you very much, that was interesting, let's move on. Then <laughs> how does it feel? Yeah, exactly. That's, I agree, Joe. Good, good, <laughs> excellent. And I think, uh, again, on the point, I think there's a lot of emphasis on experience, previous experience. Mm -hmm. um, when a new board member is appointed, uh, there's a lot of focus that have they had a board experience. Well, if we do that, then there will be no diversity, That's I right. think. You've got it to bring people on right. without board experience. It's not board experience, it's competency, exactly. So you're not going to diversify if you're, if you're always looking backwards. And I don't see a relationship, by the way, between the number of boards on which you've served and your competency on this particular board. Oftentimes directors can come not serving on a previous board that can be outstanding directors. So focus on the here, now, and forward, not going backwards. You're exactly right, Joe. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't have any further questions uh, from our audience. So Joe and Richard, if you have any uh, final thoughts or concluding comments, please go ahead. Uh, well, this has been terrific. I enjoyed working on the document under Joe's leadership and, and, and working with you, Valerie, at the conference board. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. And I think that the document is terrific. And I'm hoping that the, um, the audience members uh, um, thought this was helpful. And it was, it was my sincere pleasure to work with the conference board and ACCA. So thank you, everybody. And then from me, um, thank you very much for bearing with me uh, in terms of the little bit of uh, technology hiccups and noises. Um, I very much enjoy talking with you and uh, listening to the questions. I hear that the people are very much involved in the subject. And my last message is that good governance is not just about large companies. I'm currently doing a research on small governance, uh, sorry, small companies, and then how they approach to formalize um, a key sort of factors that would make organizations robust. And then people are very much aware what are important, such as vision, strategy, and then the values that people bring. But it's a, it's a point of how much they can formalize as the companies grow. But I think it's an important aspect that um, it, it's, it's worth revisiting on a regular sort of cycle. Otherwise, the world moves on too fast and realigns that need um, at the later stage could be too late. Mm -hmm. And big companies have always been small companies, exactly. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you both so much uh, for this great presentation. We certainly appreciate mm -hmm. it.